Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's post-grant webinar series. My name is Rick Bacinius and joining me today is my colleague, Karin Girani, and we will be presenting Post-Grant 101. Uh, our biographies, the presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are all available for download on your control panel. Please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. You will not receive credit for listening to the audio portion only. Today's webinar will run for one hour and includes a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program in the Q&A area of your control panel. We'll do our best to answer questions as they come up or at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar, and I, I mean that. I love talking about post-grant review, and I'm always happy to answer questions, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, we have also included some links at the end of the presentation to a series of articles on post-grant review from Fish's Intellectual Property Law Essentials blog that I co-authored. Uh, the articles at those links dig into more details on the topics that we will be discussing today and are part of a broader series of informative articles on pretty much every aspect of intellectual property law. So if you're interested in learning more about post-grant review or any other topic touching on intellectual property, including copyright, and trademark, and trade secret law, you can check out those uh, blogs by searching for Fish Intellectual Property Law Essentials blog. Uh, before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. All right, can we have the next slide, please? So today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, an overview of the different types of post-grant proceedings. Or then I'm going to talk about the Patent Trial and Appeals Board, otherwise known as the PTAB, and the judges that sit on the Patent Trials and Appeals Board. Uh, we'll be talking about the interplay between litigation and IPRs, discovery during IPR and PGR proceedings, oral hearings for IPR and PGR proceedings, and recent developments in exercise of discretionary denial of IPR proceedings. Next slide, please. So the three main types of post-grant proceedings that we'll be talking about today are inter partes review, otherwise known as IPR, post-grant review, otherwise known as PGR, and ex parte reexamination. Uh, the first two, inter partes review and post-grant review, are relatively new. Uh, they were uh, part of the American Invents Act that was passed in 2012 and uh, have since become a very popular forum for challenging the validity of patents at the Patent Office. Ex parte reexamination, you may have heard of, has been around for quite some time. Uh, those first began in 1981, and uh, the process for ex parte reexamination has remained largely unchanged since then. Um, you may have heard of a few other types of proceedings, uh, inter partes reexamination and uh, covered business method review. We are not covering those today as neither one of those types of proceedings exist anymore. Um, there are still uh, a few inter parte reexaminations that are ongoing and uh, several covered business method review uh, proceedings that are ongoing. But as of September 16th, uh, covered business method review, new petitions for covered business method review are no longer available. All right, next slide, please. So starting out with the uh, main form uh, for challenging patents under the American Invents Act, we have inter partes review. So this is an inter partes proceeding between a petitioner and a patent owner. Um, uh, it can only be initiated by a petitioner uh, nine months after uh, a patent's grant. Uh, and that, that's for patents with a post uh, American Invents Act priority. If a patent has a pre-American Invents Act priority date, you can actually challenge, say it's, say it's a continuation of a continuation, you can actually challenge it under IPR prior to that nine months after grant. Um, the petition must be filed within one year of service of a complaint for patent infringement, but as we'll get to towards the end of this presentation, um, certain developments at the patent office uh, dealing with discretionary denial petitions have actually shrunk that one year window in some cases uh, by several months. Uh, furthermore, prior art 
for the inter parte reviews can include patents and printed publications. And uh, uh, the patents can generally be challenged only on anticipation and obviousness grounds. Uh, there are certain situations where uh, a, a, a patent owner is allowed to make amendments to a claim and then other areas such as uh, 112 and 101 uh, will come into effect. But under a typical IPR proceeding in which the patent owner does not seek to amend the claims, the only grounds under which the patent can be found invalid are anticipation and obviousness. All right, next slide, please. Hey everyone, this is Karin Girani. Um, we've got the post-grant review next. Um, it's that this one, in a lot of ways, is is similar to the IPR. They're both inter partes proceeding, meaning that it's an adverse proceeding between a, a patent owner and a petitioner at the at the PTAB. Um, the the difference, though, that's articulated on this slide is that. Unlike IPRs, which are only available after nine months of the patents grant, um, and PG PGRs or post-grant reviews are only available within the nine-month period. So, uh, you know, in, in a way, that that within nine-month period of the patents grant can be a little limiting. A lot of times, lit litigants have not maybe decided uh, to to bring suit on a patent um, until nine months after. So. Uh, so that's part of the reason why you see the IPRs being a little bit more common for them uh, for challenging patents than, than PGRs because by the time a litigation ensues or, or things like that, it's probably nine months after uh, the patent's grant. Um, the other big difference between the PGR and the IPR is that unlike the IPR where you only have a patents and printed publications, uh, in the PGR setting, you, you have access to all other types of um, that you could normally leverage in the district court. So things like evidence of public use, on sale activity, public disclosure. So all of that is fair game in a PGR. So from a prior art uh, invalidity standpoint, it, it arguably has more teeth than an IPR would. Um, and then even uh, the in terms of the grounds that can be raised to challenge the challenge in a PGR are not just limited to anticipation and obviousness. Uh, it now would include lack of inscription, enablement, indefiniteness, so all the 112 defensives, defenses that would be available in district court as well as subject matter eligibility 101. So, you know, to draw on a point that Rick just made, uh, in a motion to amend practice in an IPR, you have the full gambit of defenses available, but on the base petition itself, you can only challenge anticipation and obviousness. Um, on the base petition of the post grant review, in contrast, you actually have more avenues for grounds of invalidity available to you. Like I said, the 112 and the 101 defenses available. Um, next slide. All right, the last form of proceeding that we're going to discuss is ex parte re examination. Uh, anyone can file a request for an ex parte re-examination. So that can be a third party or the patent owner. Um, there can be strategic reasons that a patent owner would want to request a re-examination. Uh, perhaps they found um, some prior art that uh, they think could potentially be invalidating or, or at least comes close. And so they may want to submit that art to the patent office, go through the re-examination proceeding and either amend the claims or come out of re-examination with claims that get around that art before uh, trying to assert it. Um, there could be other reasons that a, a patent owner would want to enter an ex parte re-examination proceeding to, to get new claims as well. Um, otherwise, a third party can also uh, enter the proceeding. Um, much like in IPR, they can only challenge the patents using printed publications and other patents. And the standard for re-examination is that it must raise a substantial new question of patentability, which is a, a lower threshold than for institution of an IPR or PGR proceeding. Um, uh, one downside on the requester side is a third party requester cannot participate in the re-examination uh, proceeding once it's granted. That's why uh, many uh, patent challengers prefer IPR or PGR because 
they're still allowed to participate in the proceeding after institution. Uh, the proceedings for ex parte reexamination are handled by the Central Reexamination Unit, which is a special group of examiners uh, in the Patent Office, uh, rather than uh, judges on the Patent Trials and Appeals Board. Uh, before we move on, I'm going to answer a uh, one question that's come in here. Uh, is there an action possible before grant if an application is infringing? And uh, here I'm assuming that you're asking if there's something similar to a, a European opposition where you can uh, challenge the validity of a patent after it's been uh, allowed but before it's been granted. And in the US, there really is not an equivalent process uh, to the European opposition. The Really the only thing a, um, a third party can do prior to grant of a patent is they can submit art to the patent office uh, and with respect to a particular um, uh, patent application and uh, the examiner will take a look at that art. Um, but generally, this, this isn't a, a practice that's generally undertaken because it, it doesn't give the challenge, it doesn't give the third party an opportunity to really point out uh, how the claims are invalid. Um, and the third party doesn't really have any participation in the proceeding. Um, therefore, usually the best alternative in such a situation, if, if you're um, looking at a patent and it's, it might be granted or it's been allowed but has not issued yet, that'd be a time to start preparing a, a, a post-grant review challenge, a PGR challenge, as uh, you only have nine months after grant to file it. And sometimes these petitions can take a long time to prepare. Um, all right, we'll get to some more questions later. For now, we'll go to the next slide. All right, uh, this is Karin again. So here we're, we're talking about who, what is the PTAB, PTAB and who are the judges? Uh, and I saw a question come in in the chat about what is AIA. So AIA is the America Invents Act, which is the, the pivotal change that happened earlier this decade, um, in the 2010 decade, regarding the changing from the first to invent provisions of the previous law to first to file. And as part of that AI um, statute, there was a there was a, a massive creation of the the PTAB and all these IPR and PGR type rules. Um, and, and so, so that's apropos for this slide, which is about the PTAB. So prior to the PTAB, you had the BPAI, which was the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences. Um, with the AIA, the BPAI was replaced with with the PTAB as the adjudicatory body of the PTO. So uh, what that really means is that you now have two branches of the PTAB, one being the appeals division and the trials division. So the appeals division would take up appeals much like the BPAI did uh, in cases of active prosecution. Um, so, you know, cases where you have rejections in front of the examiner, you appeal them, the appeals division would, would handle that. Um, the trials division is what, what focuses on all these post-grant proceedings, the PGRs, the IPRs, and until recently, the CBM. Um, and so uh, what's, what's unique about the PTAB, given that you know, you're within the PTO side, is that you've got these the panel of judges who are steeped in technology. These are actually, uh, actually people who are, who are good at who, who, who have the technical expertise. So in a way, they're, they're very different from your district court judges who normally don't have, the, don't, don't have that type of technical background. So you see a lot higher level arguments being advanced at the, at the district court level. But when you get down into the PTAB, they're, because of how technically adept the judges are, um, you, you see a lot more complex arguments being able to be leveraged and actually being more successful than they otherwise would be in, a, in the parallel district court jurisdiction. Um, and, and, you know, the technical expertise just goes to the fact that all of the judges have a BS in the scientific uh, backgrounds, engineering or some scientific discipline. Um, and then they all are steeped patent law people, they're patent prosecutors or litigators of 10 to 15 years of practice. Um, so, you know, given, given their technical adeptness, you know, I think that that's a strong contributor to the, 
the standard of review that is presented for PTAB's factual findings. So if, if a IPR final written decision is now challenged at the federal circuit, the, the federal circuit approaches it with a high level of deference using the substantial evidence standard, you know, and, and similar to the clear, clear and convincing standard, that is, that's a very difficult standard to, to overcome on a factual finding. You have to have a very, very strong case of why there was some, some, there was some mistake done. So, um, you know, that, that's one advantage of a PTAB being present as, as a technical back technical forum, but at the same time, it also means that their their uh, their findings are going to be less susceptible for review going forward. Next slide. Okay, before I jump into the the timeline here, I want to answer another question that came up, and I see several, and we're going to get to some of these in the later slides. But one I wanted to address now is about. Uh, advantages of um, ex parte re-exam over an IPR or PGR uh, is the uh, someone asked if the only advantage is the lower threshold of institution and actually the main advantage is that there is no time bar for a third party re-exam request um, and so uh, it could be possible that it's been over a year since you've been served with a complaint or it, it could be a situation where uh, your client has found out late in the game that they need to indemnify somebody else. And so the complaint's already been served 10 months prior and, and they just don't have the time to get uh, an IPR petition together. Uh, and so they can, uh, uh, you can you can avoid this the one year time bar uh, by filing a third party uh, ex parte re-exam request. Uh, a few other advantages are that there is no estoppel that attaches to a re-exam request. We're going to talk about estoppel with IPR and PGR a little bit later. Um, and uh, another advantage is that generally it's just cheaper. Uh, you're not going to have depositions. You're not going to have uh, oral hearings. Um, and uh, uh, you're not going to have multiple briefs prepared uh, by, uh, by the challenger. Uh, in an ex parte re-exam, you prepare the re-exam request. You might have an expert declaration, you might not. Uh, you submit that to the patent office and then you kind of just sit back and, and monitor what happens. <laughs> All right, um, turning back to the slides. Um, here's a timeline for a uh, you know, typical inter parties review timeline. And this, this 18 month period is actually statutory, which is one great thing about these challenges is that uh, in almost every situation, uh, you will have a final written decision by 18 months. There have been a, a very small number of cases. I'm aware of one or two uh, where the board has granted an extension for good cause, but usually they try to get these wrapped up within the statutory time frame. Uh, one thing that I'll point out about this timeline in the slide is that day zero is not actually the day the petition is filed. Day zero is the day that the patent office uh, issues what's called the um, notice of filing date accorded. So you file your petition and sometime within one to three weeks later, the patent office sends back a notification that they've received your petition and, and they're awarding you a filing date. And the date that you get that notification is actually day zero and the patent owner preliminary response is due uh, at the three month deadline after that. But as you can see uh, in this timeline, there's uh, you know, several different uh, periods for briefing after uh, that notice of filing date accorded. The patent owner has three months to file a preliminary response. Um, usually there will not be any more briefing from the petitioner, but uh, the petitioner can ask for a sir reply to that response, or for a reply to that response um, under special circumstances, which may or may not be granted by the board. Uh, the institution decision generally comes at month, month six, and if institution is denied, that's sort of the end of things. The petitioner can uh, file a request for rehearing, but under the statute, uh, except for under very rare circumstances, the petitioner cannot file an appeal to the federal circuit. They really can just ask the board to uh, review their decision, and if that fails, they're kind of out of luck in this situation. Um, if the petition is instituted, that starts the one year clock from institution until final written decision. Uh, 
the patent owner has another three months to file their formal response. Um, usually that'll involve uh, a deposition of the expert from the petitioner. Um, petitioner gets a reply three months after the patent owner's response. The patent owner gets a SIR reply one month later, and then uh, eventually there's an oral hearing before the final written decision. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, so this one is about seeking a stay. So you, you can imagine where if you're filing an IPR and, and, and you know, this is equally applicable to PTRs that will use IPRs as the most popular uh, base case. Um, if you file an IPR petition, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that you shouldn't have to, uh, to, to litigate that patent in the parallel court setting. Uh, considering that in an IPR you, you could potentially invalidate the patent. So, so, you know, there's definitely some efficiencies that can be achieved by staying the parallel district court case when you file an IPR. Uh, the, the problem, though, is that uh, there's, there's a little bit of a tug of war that happens between the district court and the PCAB uh, on this front. So district courts generally are, are reluctant to grant stays when, you're, when you have filed an IPR. Um, Unless, unless it's early enough, the so district courts are mindful that there is the PTAB jurisdiction that is technically adept, that, that can handle these things in a, in a relatively quick fashion, uh, but, but they don't want, typically across the, across the country, they don't want to be at the eve of trial or, or two months before trial or things like that, um, and grant a stay waiting 12 to 18 months for a decision from an IPR. Now that, so, so early enough in litigation, maybe the district court is more inclined to, to grant a stay, but it varies. Early enough in litigation is, is very relative across the, across the country. I've seen cases where two months prior to trial, a district court has been willing to stay. And then I've seen cases where two or three months into the case, as soon as contentions, invalidity contentions and infringement contentions have been served, um, courts just do not want to grant the stay. And, and a lot of it is also triggered by when the trial is set. So if you're in a rocket docket, uh, there's a high chance that that court will probably get to trial before the PTAB ever issues a final written decision. So those courts, you'll see a lot of times, are just hesitant to grant the stay. And then on the flip side, the PTAB also has discretionary authority. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit down later in the slides. Um, but PTAB can discretionarily deny a petition if the, if the litigation is an advanced stage, and there are some additional factors to that, but the, the state of the litigation is, is, is a big factor that factors into it. So the upshot of all of this is, is just that if you're a petitioner seeking to uh, seeking an IPR or post-grant review of a patent at the PTAB, you want to act fast. Earlier, the better. The longer you wait, the, long, the more chances you have that the district court does not grant the stay and the PTAB discretionarily denies your petition, even if it was a meritorious petition, right? So they, they have the authority to do that and, and they, they will exercise it uh, more and more recently as we're seeing. Next slide, please. All right, claim construction uh, in post-grant proceedings. So claim construction is actually one area where uh, these IPR and PGR proceedings kind of bridge the gap between a, a trial on validity and a, a typical patent prosecution proceeding. Um, it, when uh, the American Events Act was first passed and these IPR proceedings first started, the broadest reasonable interpretation uh, claim construction standard was applied to IPRs. But since then, the uh, the Patent Trials and Appeals Board has changed their rules. They're now applying the Phillips Claim Construction Standard which is the same standard applied uh, by federal courts. Um, this has, uh, uh, I haven't seen a practical effect from this, but definitely has made uh, appeals a little more streamlined since everybody is operating under the same claim construction. Um, a few other issues to think about with claim construction, uh, especially from the patent owner side during an IPR is that prosecution disclaimer can arise based on claim construction positions at the PTAB and prosecution history estoppel can also prevent a patent owner from asserting uh, infringement under the doctrine of equivalence based on an IPR argument that a claim is valid over a prior art equivalent. Um, those are the formal 
situation. There's also just uh, the matter of uh, generally a district court and the PTAB don't like to see a party um, arguing for a claim construction in one direction in one forum and a, and a different claim construction in a different forum. And uh, so generally it's best to be on the same page uh, as your litigation counsel if you are not also the litigation counsel and make sure that your claim constructions are uh, consistent with each other and that any positions you're taking with respect to validity or infringement uh, are consistent uh, between the two different forums. All right, next slide. All right, prior art estoppel. Um, so I, I saw a question come in in the chat about estoppel, so know that I wasn't ignoring you, I was just waiting for this slide. It, let's start with the IPR, but there are interesting questions about PGR that are coming up in the chat that are that I'll answer as well. Um, if the so here's how it goes: if the PTAB has now issued a final written decision uh, in an IPR, gen generally you're stopped from asserting any invalidity, patent and publication aren't invalidity in the related litigation, um, and and so that that's a serious. So while so this is kind of like one of those trade-offs that you get. You you get to go to the PTAB with a, with a more technical panel and have the, the the patent thrown out as invalid. But by the same token, if you fail, you are now stopped from asserting any patent publication in the related litigation. And and really, the question is, I'm being a little imprecise when I say any. It's it's any that you could have raised or reasonably could have raised at the IPR and. And there's a lot of there's a lot of debate across different district courts what that what that phrase means. Does that mean what you could have started at the outset of the uh, when you filed the IPR or once the IPR was actually instituted? And, and it creates some interesting nuances in the law, which are, are a little out of scope for today's discussion. But but suffice to say that uh, you there's a big prior art estoppel. That applies in the IPR setting for for once once you are reached the final written decision, and, and I said generally any patent and publication art is generally not available in litigation. Uh, there are possibilities where you know patents and publication art have been resuscitated, uh, for lack of better words, as system art uh, in the litigation. That now you can't just say uh, you know there's this product manual that I used in the IPR, and, and here's the product manual again in the litigation and i'm now talking about the product uh, you know you can't it can't be just a a front for saying this is now a system you need to actually show what a system prior art would be so if there's testimony of witnesses or like system diagrams or, or things that just could not uh that are not fodder for the printed publications um could be raised as an overall system that is still available in, in litigation um so that's that's something to to keep in mind that you you don't have all avenues are not lost you still have access to system prior art and part of that could include uh, publications that may or may not have been used in the IPR but you have to proceed with caution there. Um, on the PGR front, uh, there were some questions about is the estoppel a little bit more damning and and, and I think that's right. There, there's still a little bit of a split out there, but at least some of the district court cases. Um, well, let me back up. PGR is like we said earlier, you have additional uh, prior art available, so it's not just limited to patent and publication art, and you have additional grounds available, including 112 and 101 uh, defenses. And I, I've seen cases where the prior art, uh, where it's any non-patent and non-publication art is also stopped uh, because that have taken a, a more broad view of what raised or reasonably could have been raised, uh, take a broader view of that, and they, they effectively preclude you from, from arguing any art. So arguably, in PGRs, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, you might be out of luck with system prior art as well. Um, so maybe that's one benefit of the IPR over the PGR as well, because at least you have some art that's preserved, uh, even if you ultimately lose in the, at the PTAB. Um, the other issues about the additional grounds, um, additional grounds that, that you could have raised, the 112, the 101 issues, there are some courts that have come out and said the reason raised or recently could have been raised affects grounds of invalidity, and that, well, those grounds could be 
uh, 112 and 101 issues, and so they might preclude you. So in a PGR setting, once you're once you get to the final written decision, arguably, depending again on your jurisdiction, and that's always going to be the case here. Um, how, maybe some courts will not allow you to effectively gut your invalidity case at the at the district court. So there's some stark consequences depending on your jurisdiction again, in a PGR setting versus in an IPR. Um, before uh, before we move away, there was a question about is product literature printed or printed or on the website a printed publication? Um, I, I think. Depending, you you could. I've seen it actually when it's on a website. Uh, we've we've I personally have used cases where using the Wayback Machine as a printed publication in in, in an IPR setting. So certainly website disclosures, if if, if truly uh, are public, could be used in an IPR setting. All right, next slide. And I'll just jump in off of that last point um, about. Uh, product literature printed on, on a website or printed in a publication. Um, yes, that's considered a printed publication. I'm aware of at least one case where um, uh, you know, a petitioner filed IPR petitions, they raised some prior art based on a, an Italian patent. Uh, they were stopped from using that in the district court. And so then they argued that their invalidity grounds is a combination of that Italian patent and the system prior art from, from a, it, was a, it was a car. And uh, the, the patent owner basically said, well, here's a bunch of manuals that all explained all of the details from, uh, from that car. And so you, know, you reasonably could have raised this ground because there's nothing new about the details of this car as it existed that aren't in these prior art manuals. And that and that argument ended up winning the day. The, the district court decided, yes, that uh, defendant you know, the petitioner from the IPR could have reasonably raised that ground. They could have turned to those manuals uh, for that car as a printed publication. Um, and one other issue related to that is uh, when it comes to a website, uh, Karin mentioned, we've used the Wayback Machine. Um, that can be a popular avenue for showing um, that a, a particular website existed at a specific date. But I will caution that so far uh, in its eight years of existence, the PTAB has been stricter than a lot of district courts on the level of evidence needed to show public availability. And uh, therefore, it's usually a best practice to not just have a, um, a screen capture from the Wayback Machine, but to actually have an affidavit from uh, you know, a librarian or you know, somebody that attended the conference where that, that paper was presented or or somebody that has firsthand knowledge that that particular publication was actually available uh, at the date indicated. A website that has a date at the bottom or a website that's captured by the Wayback Machine uh, without more, the, the patent office, the, the PTAB is generally not going to uh, acknowledge that it was a printed publication because uh, one of the requirements is that it has to have been a publication that somebody of skill in the art could have located. All right, so moving on to the, the slide that's in front of you. Um, as I mentioned before, there is limited discovery during these IPR and PTR proceedings, and this generally happens in that time frame shown inside the red box. So uh, when the petitioner files their petition, uh, almost always they will include an expert declaration to support the assertions in the petition. Although I have seen petitions filed without expert declarations, and generally those have not done very well. Um, after institution is when the discovery period starts. And so between institution and the patent owner response, the patent owner has the ability to uh, question the petitioner's expert um, and seek other discovery, including uh, you know, seeking additional supporting evidence uh, for that you know, supports uh, authentication evidence of, of submitted exhibits. Um, the patent owner will usually also include an expert declaration with their response, and the petitioner will have a chance to depose that expert during the three-month period between the patent owner response and the petitioner's reply. Sometimes there'll be yet another expert declaration with the petitioner's reply, and so therefore the, the patent owner would have the chance to uh, depose the expert with respect to that second uh, expert declaration and, uh, and then include that as evidence with their patent owner sir reply. All right, next slide, please.
So this kind of covers a lot of what I just uh, talked about. Um, the routine discoveries and any exhibit cited in a paper or testimony. So basically any time that you submit a, a paper during these proceedings, the petition, the patent owner's response, the petitioner's reply, any exhibit that you cite to, you need to include uh, a, a copy of that. So all the references you're relying on, either as part of your grounds of challenge or as background references, uh, need to be included with that paper. Um, Cross-examination of the party declarant is allowed. Um, uh, and then relevant, relevant information that is inconsistent with the position advanced during the proceeding. Um, that's more of a, an MPRE question come to life in that bullet point. I actually attended a CLE last Friday, oh, virtually, that we spent an hour talking about just that one bullet point alone, so I'm not going to go into details on that one. Um, additional discovery can include um, motions. Uh, it requires a motion for additional discovery unless the two parties will agree to the additional discovery. Um, and usually what the party that wants the additional discovery would do is they would discuss with the other, the opposing counsel to see if they can come to an agreement. If they can't, you email the board, the board requesting uh, permission to submit a motion for the additional discovery. Um, and those motions are only granted if it is in the interest of justice. And generally, uh, the area where we've seen the most uh, requests for additional discovery granted is related to privity and real party and interest. We talked a lot about estoppel today, and uh, the real party and interest and uh, privity identifications, especially for the petitioner, are, are important because it's not just the petitioner that's stopped, it's all of the real parties and interests that are stopped from uh, utilizing that prior art, or in the case of the PGR prior art, potentially the other 101 or 112 grounds uh, for invalidity in the district court. And so, uh, and the pro the real party and interest also factors into the one year time bar. So say that a particular company is indemnifying another company, uh, they would need to identify that other company as a real party and interest. And it's the service date of the earliest real party and interest that has been sued that starts the ticking of that one year time bar. And this has been a, a make or break situation in several cases where one party filed a petition, there was discovery about real party and interest, the board determined that uh, uh, a different company that should have been named real party and interest had not been named and therefore the petition was time barred. All right, next slide please. Yeah, and what I'll do, I'll say to, to Rick's last point, you know, I'll say that the, in a recent case that, that I had, um, you know, we, we went through a lot of effort to try to show that for, we were we were petitioners in that case, uh, and we were or we were sorry, excuse me, we were patent owners in that case, and we were dealing with a privity RPI situation, um, and, and a lot of the information about that was within the with the patent owner, um, and yet you know we we jumped through several hoops to, to establish that just what we're asking for is. Just, not possible for us to get without some discovery because we we're in the back of our mind we were, we were aware of all this PTAB or the PTAB is very reluctant to grant additional discovery and even in the RPI privity setting there uh, they exercised a lot of a lot of discretion I'll say uh, in, in granting that request so if you want to prove up privity in RPI you really need to show that there's just no possible way that that will be that information is available and also um, that information is very, very pertinent to establishing privity and RPI, which admittedly can be a little difficult uh, because you're effectively trying to, you need something to prove privity and RPI, yet you don't know what that is just yet. Uh, so it, it can create an interesting dynamic where it becomes difficult for a patent owner to establish. Um, all right, let's see. So on, on to depositions, though. Uh, this is This is a... Uh, for me personally, for coming from a litigation background, there there are some interesting uh, differences here compared to uh, the, I, compared to the district court practice. Uh, but but first things first, this the expert witnesses are, are generally the ones who get deposed. So typically, uh, petitioners and patent owners will have uh, their own uh, respective experts, and then uh, each of them. Uh, and, the, and, and those each of those are subject to depositions, as you saw in the timeline that Rick talked about. Uh, 
in fact, witnesses are generally not deposed. Uh, very rarely does that come up. And normally, that's the deposition of fact witnesses is only allowed when uh, there's a date of invention is, is at issue. So typically cases where credibility of the witness is important, depositions uh, are, are, are granted there. Um, like federal district court, you'll see no speaking objections are allowed. Uh, but unlike district court, where almost every deposition that I've taken in district court setting has been a video deposition, um, here there's generally no video depositions un unless you request PTAB authorization. Uh, the timing is also different. Uh, district court, typically you get seven hours. If you're in other jurisdictions like ITC, maybe you get more. Uh, but here, if you tally up all the time between a cross exam, a redirect, and the recross, uh, that amounts to about 13 hours. Now, I am not aware of any any deposition in a in an IPR setting that has gone that long. I'd be surprised if any are. Uh, typically, typically uh, both both sides exercise a lot of uh, caution in, in depositions, especially of expert witnesses. Uh, they, they focus in on the key issues uh, such that the, the scope of the cross is very limited. And because you're limited by the scope of the cross, everything in, for, for the redirect, um, you, you can't now go about talking about other aspects that might have been referenced in the expert declaration. So because each, each round of testimony in the cross redirect setting is, is limited by the scope of the previous session, you're uh, you're effectively limited at each point. So rarely do you ever see a, a 13 hour present, a 13 hour deposition testimony. Um, more and more often than not, you're, you're probably wrapping up in seven hours across all parties. Um, you know, but but you have the statute allows at least for for, for a significant amount of time if you need it. I just want um, to jump in. I just want sure. to jump in real quick. Uh, I I was involved in a deposition that went for almost 12 hours. Uh, it was it was for two proceedings because uh, we were challenging two patents, same same parties involved, same expert, and so we just consolidated the deposition for both uh, both proceedings into into one session. But we went into a second day, and I couldn't believe it that wow. we were there for for that long. Um, and it was really all just the the direct from the other side or the cross exam from the other side. We did we I don't think we did a redirect or we might have and it might have taken a couple minutes, but uh they can they can last long. Uh but I've also had one that lasted 40 minutes total. So yeah. um the cost of deposition borne by the taking party, that's pretty standard. Um the entire transcript should be filed as an exhibit. So you know, unlike district court where you'll have depot designations, uh, the plaintiff will designate a portion of the deposition, then the defendant does designate the rest to, to make sure you, you've covered all. Here, the entire transcript goes in as an exhibit. If you're going to rely on it, the entire transcript is going in and is now part of the record. And so there's no, no depot designation business that we have to do in district court in the PTAP setting. Next slide. All right, so what to expect at your oral hearing. Um, as I mentioned at the top of this uh, uh, presentation, we have articles addressing all of these topics on our uh, FISH uh, uh, IP Law Essentials blog. And this, this particular blog, I think I would recommend if you're interested in what the oral hearings look like, because we went into a bit more detail on those. Uh, but this is framed from uh, an oral hearing during non-pandemic times. Uh, I have not participated in a remote oral hearing yet, but I have one coming up in a couple of months, and I've, I've talked to some of my colleagues about how they go. Um, generally, about the same as uh, you, know, you would expect a remote uh, uh, hearing of this type to go. Uh, you just have to go slower and make sure you're not speaking over people. But uh, with respect to this slide, I'll talk about uh, the way these have been conducted for the first seven years and hopefully very soon out into the future. Um, You'll be uh, at, usually you'll be uh, at the uh, USPTO headquarters in Alexandria. There'll be your three judge panel. These are the same three judges that you've been interacting with for the entire proceeding. Uh, you'll have counsel for both parties, um, and then any member of the public can usually uh, attend. You can submit uh, 
a request to have the proceeding be you know, under seal if you're going to be talking about confidential information. Uh, that Those have been granted. Uh, I've never participated in a panel like that, but I have uh, had oral hearings uh, that I've conducted where members of the public have shown up. Um, usually it's law students or um, younger attorneys are just interested in the process and want to see it uh, in person, but uh, you will sometimes have an audience. Um, so the logistics uh, in the oral hearing, um, uh, they're all listed in the order that you're going to get from the pat or from the from the board. Um, this will tell you when to exchange your demonstratives, when to submit your objections to demonstratives, and uh, when to request your special presentation equipment. Try not to miss these deadlines. Uh, the PTAB will not be happy about it. And you need to request anything that you need for your uh, visual presentation. So if you need an overhead projector, you need to request an overhead projector. Uh, if you're going to be showing slides off your laptop, uh, you need to coordinate with the board and they'll put you in touch usually with an IT person to make sure that you they have the right connectors or that you bring the right connectors uh, to connect your computer to the overhead projector. Um, uh, when it comes to exchange of demonstratives, uh, I would highly recommend just try to work out your objections with the other party before you get to the oral hearing. Um, the board doesn't like it when you bring them into a fight over demonstratives, and so it's best avoided if at all possible. Um, the timing, it's going to be specified in the uh, uh, scheduling order that the board will issue at the time of institution. Um, it's usually going to be about a month to a month and a half, sometimes two months prior to when the final written decision is due. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's usually at the PTO headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, but they have started having oral hearings at remote offices. Um, there's an office in Detroit, there's an office in Denver. Uh, I know there are several others uh, spread throughout the country that I have not been to, uh, but uh, sometimes these, uh, these oral hearings at other locations. And usually it, one of the judges on the panel judge will be uh, participating remotely. And so you'll, you'll be looking at uh, a bench. Uh, it, looks, it looks like a courtroom. You'll be looking at a bench with uh, two judges in their robes behind the bench and the third judge in a robe on a TV screen, usually you know, in their own home or sometimes uh, at a, a local court or a court looking uh, classroom at a local law school. During pandemic times, it seems as if everybody is just in their homes the way we all have been. Um, so uh, the the logistics, uh, this is that each party has one hour to present their case. But uh, when requesting the oral hearing, a party can actually uh, request how much time they would like. Uh, oftentimes, these oral hearings, uh, like I mentioned earlier, cases can be consolidated. So if the same parties are involved in uh, IPR challenges to maybe two or three patents, uh, often they'll be assigned to the same panel of judges and the arguments for all two or three patents will happen all at once. And so when requesting the oral hearing, you can request uh, you know, a, a specific amount of time. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, if we're feeling good about our case, we'll request 45 minutes per side, maybe for a, you know, a set of two patents together and not the full two hours per side since there are technically two proceedings. Um, as I previously mentioned, demonstratives can be used at the hearing, um, but they need to be submitted uh, a court, uh, ahead of time according to the schedule uh, in the um, order, the oral hearing order. And uh, live testimony is rarely allowed unless witness credibility is relevant. And um, uh, our firm, Fish and Richardson, a few of my colleagues here in our Minneapolis office actually recently uh, had one of the few live witness testimony uh, cases where they brought a witness uh, to the uh, the PTAB and she gave testimony during the oral hearing uh, and there was there was direct and there was cross examination all uh, during the proceeding. In, in that case, it was a fact witness and it was actually one of the inventors uh, on the patent that was being challenged because a big issue was um, when the invention had been invented. This was a pre America Invents Act. Uh, patent application, and therefore the issue was not first to file, uh, but priority was based on the time of the actual invention. And so credibility of the witness as to you know, verifying evidence of when they had developed this particular invention was, was important, and 
Therefore, the, the court allowed the, the request to have a, a live witness. And there have been other situations like that. And I think in every case that I'm aware of, it's been a fact witness and not an expert witness, but an issue where witness credibility is, is relevant to the case. All right, next slide, please. All right, so uh, earlier we talked about a little bit about discretionary denial and the importance of making sure if you're a petitioner filing as early in the life cycle of the litigation as possible. Um, and and this, this particular issue comes up now even more after the, the case cited here, which is Apple v. Finta, which was designated as presidential by the PTAB. Um, and so, so the PTAB under 314A has discretionary, has authority to discretionarily deny uh, petitions. And, and now uh, they've articulated that there was a previous iteration of, of factors that were considered, but here's the current thinking of the PTAB in terms of what constitutes, uh, what are the factors that are considered uh, when denying or not denying a petition. Uh, and, and the, some of the biggest ones that matter really are, um, you know, what a district court grant to stay, uh, and you can typically find that out pretty easily. The proximity of the court's trial date, that's a big one, um, especially, like I said, when you're in a rocket docket jurisdiction, uh, let's say the EDBA's, uh, EDBA type courts, uh, you know, this can be a particularly challenging factor for you because you're, you're looking at 10 to 12 months to trial, which uh, even by the PCAP standard is, is very fast. Um, and then the degree of overlap between the issues, that, that's always, uh, you know, neither, neither the district court nor the tab wants to duplicate issues and, and wherever they see that uh, there are issues that are being, that could be raised at the district court and have already been raised, uh, is it, is it, efficiency-wise beneficial to continue raising those issues. Um, so, so those types of issues can come up. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the, the factors, and there are other factors too, the parties and the proceedings are the same, uh, any other factors. So, you, you know, an investment by the parties. Uh, litigation can be very expensive, as everyone knows, and, and PTAB proceedings by, by contrast are, are not, uh, relatively speaking, not as expensive. Um, so, so those factor in too, but but at least in my practice so far, um, it's, it's these one, two, and four factors that, that really uh, seem to carry the day. I mean, different courts really, or different panels approach it a little bit differently. But um, if you have if you have a good argument on these factors, at least you 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 really help your case out. Um, so, for example, starting backwards, degree of overlap between the issues. Uh, in our cases, or in, we, we try to we try to minimize the grounds that that might be at issue in an IPR versus a district court. If you're if you're a petitioner, so if you're arguing invalidity based on reference A, B, and C, maybe you don't argue that same ground within the within the district court, and that way you you ensure that there's no overlap uh, in in those types of prior art issues. Um, Proximity of the course trial to day, trial date. This is really a function of to the written decision date. This is really a function of you being able to file as quickly as possible, right? And, and the trial date, unless you're in a rocket docket jurisdiction, it, it, it's going to be far out enough that you probably, if you act fast enough, let's say one to three months within being filed with the litigation, file your your petitions, you're, you're probably okay. Uh, and then how the district court does in terms of granting stays at the IPR is instituted. This varies widely by the jurisdiction. Um, you know, just using uh, Eastern District of Texas, typically the court is, is more reluctant there to grant a stay um, pending an IPR if an IPR was instituted. Um, definitely before an IPR instituted, it, it's, it's always a tough call with the Eastern District of Texas in my practice at least. Uh, but, but, you know, but there are other jurisdictions like District of Delaware where I've seen uh, this factor going very easily in the in the petitioner's favor. So all all of this really being said, you you really need to move quickly. And, and Rick earlier mentioned that you normally have a one year one year file from the filing of the litigation to the filing of your petition. 
Um, and so the earlier you are in that one year cycle, the better it is. If you're really waiting until the nine, 10, 11, 12 month period, you're, you're putting yourself in jeopardy of being discretionarily denied uh, by the PTAB under, under FinTIP. So upshot of all of this, file as early as possible. If you, for whatever reason, are not going to be able to do that, uh, you know, try to argue the facts, maybe try to minimize the, the hit uh, of overlapping issues by, you know, stipulating if necessary or uh, stipulating that you won't use that ground in litigation uh, to, to dull the effect that there will be additional issues that would be considered or that wouldn't be uh, addressed at the PTAB or vice versa. Uh, looking at a question that's coming in. I'm, I'm going to take the question on uh, um, grant proposals. Um, so the, sta the standard here, it, it is the same in IPRs and PGRs as it is in the patent office, as it is in district courts as what qualifies as uh, a printed publication. Uh, it's just um, when I was talking about differences earlier, it's the level of evidence that something's a printed publication that can differ uh, between the two different um forums uh and i just saw the question about the new york new jersey code yeah we can it's not, the new york new jersey cle code is 771 um but when it comes to a uh um, a, a grant proposal and uh this is not legal advice because i'm not aware of an actual case in this but my my instinct is that that would not be a printed publication uh, and that's just looking at the case law on this um, there's a case known as in re hall it's from 1986 it's generally considered one of the it's it's the formation of the of many questions on this in the patent bar exam uh, in that case they ruled that a doctoral thesis that was indexed and shelved in a library is sufficiently accessible to the public and constitutes prior art uh, but in a, a different case this is in re cronin from 1989, uh, that they considered there that a, a student thesis was not prior art because it wasn't actually indexed uh, in the library, and so therefore an interested member of the public would not know how to find it. Um, correlating that kind of to the modern day, in, in a case in which I was involved, uh, for, fortunately from the patent owner side on this one, the petitioner had uh, submitted a website, and the website was. Uh, from a, a home tinkerer. It, he was a hobbyist that made robots as a hobby and would compete with them. And he had a little website about them. But the petitioner had not shown, they'd shown that the website existed, but they hadn't shown that anyone would know how to get to that website or that you could find it by conducting a Google search for robotics or, or the particular area of robotics uh, with which the patent was concerned. And therefore, they determined that it, it was not sufficiently uh, available. So yeah, I, I guess a grant proposal available by a FOIA request. Um, like I said, I, I don't know for sure. It would be a question of uh, of um, a question of fact in that particular situation. But uh, if if the grant proposal is not indexed uh, and cataloged so that somebody would know that it exists, it, my my instinct is that it would not qualify as prior art. Uh, do you have any more questions you want to cover here, Karen? Uh, I, just, I just saw one, of it looks like we're, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll give a terse response to this. Uh, there was a question, uh, have there been many times when there was no stay in district court, IPR still instituted and plaintiff went to district court, uh, but then PTAP throws out or vice versa? Um, so, so this is really the, a question about parallel, parallelly proceeding uh, litigation and IPR and what happens when the courts read, when the PTAB and or the district court read contradictory uh, decisions. And, and I think I, I'm not personally familiar with how this has gotten resolved. Uh, I've seen, I've just read some articles about, you know, most of this gets resolved up on appeal. Um, so, so, but, but you know, I, I don't have a direct answer of any actual authority where I've seen this happen just from my own reading on this, the appeals court normally will take this up and, and resolve the contradictory nature of the two holdings. I, I 
think generally in that situation, you're going to be kind of in a, a, a Fresenius race. It, and if people are not aware of that, it's uh, that was an issue where uh, you know, a patent had been invalidated uh, through a re-exam request, I believe. And uh, it really was a race to who could get to a final decision first, exhaust all of their appeals. Um, and if the, if the prevailing party, the patent owner, who had won at the district court but lost their patent at the patent office, uh, was able to uh, you know, get through the appeal process and get to a, a, an actual, actual final decision before uh, all the appeals with respect to the validity of the patent had been finished. And I think that that's the answer is it, it really, really is going to depend on the timing of when those appeals are raised. Yep. All right, well, we're a minute over, but thank you everybody for uh, joining us today and we uh, look forward to seeing all of you. We do these uh, every two months. And so if you want to learn more about other post-grant review topics uh, in more detail, please join us again in the future.